So welcome. This is our final, our fifth class of Journalism Under Siege, Truth and Trust in a Time of Turmoil. I'm Don Garcia. I'm the co-host for this course and the director of the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships Program. And my other co-host is Michael Bolden, Managing Director for Communications. This speaker series is a collaboration of the JSK Fellowships and the Continuing Studies Program here at Stanford. Each of the five nights of this program has been devoted to issues that are important, key crucial issues that are part of the JSK Fellowships Program and important issues in journalism. So tonight's class is the Misinformation Society. So the midterms are just upon us very soon and we have a deluge of information coming our way uh, and a lot of misinformation coming our way. So it's flooding the internets and the and internets, yeah, that's true, the internet and the airwaves. And how does anybody make sense of it all? So this past week has been a particularly awful one in terms of misinformation and speech online uh, and what it can lead to. I just wanted to highlight one thing and then we'll move into our session here tonight. Um, there was a story in the New York Times that said on Monday, if you did a search on Instagram, the photo sharing site that's owned by Facebook, you'd find the torrent of anti-Semitic images and videos are uploaded in wake of the very tragic shooting uh, at the Pittsburgh uh, synagogue last weekend. And if you search for the word Jews, you had 11,696 posts with the hashtag Jews did 9-11, which said, claimed that Jews orchestrated the 2011, September 11th terror attacks. So I think these posts point to a real stark reality that we're facing today, which is over uh, you know, the last decade in Silicon Valley, media companies, companies have extended their reach uh, and influence all over the world. But one of the things that's glaringly apparent is they've not quite understood perhaps or tried to figure out and have not been able to uh, deal with some of the negative consequences or they've tried, but it's been very, very complicated. So we're gonna talk about that tonight. You can't really put the genie back in the bottle, so there's gonna to have to be solutions found. Tonight, I'm gonna to moderate a conversation with Alex Stamos, who's here with us. He's the former chief security officer at Facebook, and he's now working to improve the security and uh, the safety of the internet throughout his teaching and research at Stanford University. The second part of the evening will be a conversation with academics and journalists and specialists who are dealing with the effects of misinformation and how much the media trusts the public. Please check our Canvas site for full bios of our speakers. As we do every evening, we'll have a short break between the two sessions. Uh, we invite you again, as always, to uh, write your questions on index cards. You guys are getting really good at those. And give them to Erica Bartholomew. Erica also has a scarf and a key that somebody left last week. So if they're yours, please claim them. A final reminder about Canvas. Um, all the material we've been gathering for you is on the Canvas site, books, links to websites, articles, biographies. Um, they're going to be available for the rest of the quarter, but the website does turn into a pumpkin and not on Halloween. December 28th at 1159, apparently it disappears. So if you'd like to read any of those things or download them, please do that before then. We will have videos posted on YouTube as well. Okay, moving on to our key event. So Alex Stamos is a cybersecurity expert, business leader, an entrepreneur working to improve the security and safety of the internet through now teaching at Stanford. He's an adjunct professor at Stanford's Freeman Spogli Institute, the William Perry Fellow and at the Center for International Security and Cooperation and a visiting scholar at Hoover Institution. Prior to joining Facebook, he was at Yahoo, where he was the chief information security officer, and he led the company's response to the, Ed, the Edward Snowden disclosures. So we might have a few questions about that. So let's begin. Um, so you most recently were at say, Facebook, chief security officer, where you co-authored uh, a report, Information Operations in Facebook, which was an examination of the April 20, of the uh, 2016 U.S. presidential election. What were your biggest takeaways from that report? So that report was a kind of mid, 
a progress report on a, a research project that we kicked off after the 2016 okay. election okay. to try to dive into what is fake news. And if you remember, I mean fake news in the context and what it was used in 2016. <laughs> okay. The term fake news has a different connotation now, but at the time people were talking about the, you know, um, Pope endorses Trump stories. Right. Hillary actually has cancer stories. All okay. of those kinds yeah. of stories that you saw on social media. And there's a question of this content, where does it come from? Who is driving it? What is their purpose? Right. And there's a big project to kind of dive into that and figure it out. And the, and the truth is, is from a volume perspective and from the amount of stuff people saw, the vast majority of what people were calling fake news at the time is actually driven from people who are financially and ideologically motivated to push it. Um, not by Russians or any other foreign actors. The vast, vast majority comes from that. But then as part of that, we had found groups that looked aligned with Russian interests. And one of the things we want to do in the paper is kind of tease apart the various, you know, instead of just using the fake news terms, we tried to come up with definitions of misinformation, disinformation, information operation, and then we laid out the model of at what at that point we believed a, a Russian information operation looked like. So a couple questions with that. So yeah. what is the difference between misinformation, disinformation, what was the third? Uh, information operation. Information operation. Yeah, so f for our purposes, um, and this is a problem in that people who work in tech, work in journalism, work in uh, kind of offensive cyber have very different definitions of all this. Okay. For our purposes, we were using the term misinformation to mean information that is misleading or untrue that is shared uh, without knowledge of that fact. So, you know, information that is reshared and pushed, um, not necessarily with, uh, with the intention of misleading. Okay. Disinformation is in information that is pushed intentionally to mislead. And information operations is the umbrella term for operations on behalf of an organized group, most likely aligned with a state government, but not necessarily, and we can talk a little bit about some of the post-2016 elections, okay. where that definition becomes more interesting. But with a, an organized group to affect a geopolitical goal through manipulating the information environment. So that could include misinformation, disinformation, it also includes offensive cyber capabilities to feed into the misinformation, disinformation campaigns. Right. So the misinformation operations, and you, you mentioned Inform yeah. uh, they're not all Russian, but some of them were supporting or tied to. Who are these people? So we'll take a, a bit of a step back. There are really three categories of Russian operations against the US election in 2016. The first was the pure propaganda uh, operations that happened mostly on social media. Um, and the people behind that were generally people working for private organizations with a nebulous connection to the Russian state infrastructure, um, but that are clearly trying to work on the same playbook as the Russian intelligences. And so the, the umbrella term for a bunch of these is called Prozik Lakta, which is the name of the street that the main office used to be on. People talk about the Internet Research Agency. Internet Research Agency is one of the shell corporations mm. that was uncovered uh, in 2014, they actually use a bunch of different shell companies now. But effectively, you can use Internet Research Agency as an umbrella term for all the people working for this private organization owned by an oligarch who's actually a restaurateur uh, and a, hmm. a, a friend of Putin's. Um, and their goal is to push divisive narratives in America generally and around the election, obviously, then to, to do so around um, the candidates and the, the topics that are in the election. Um, we can come back to what that model looks like a, a little bit more if you like. Okay. The second category of operation was the operation run by the GRU, which the GRU is the main intelligence directorate of the Russian military. So we don't have a direct equivalent mm. of this organization in the United States. It's something like a combination of the CIA, the Defense uh, um, Information Agency, DIA, intelligence agency, uh, and parts of the NSA. But these are people who work for the uniform generals of the Russian military. And the GRU's Offensive cyber operations are often focused on weakening NATO and weakening um, uh, weakening enemies of, of the Russian Federation uh, as part of kind of hybrid warfare against the overall NATO alliance. The GRU activity was a hack and leak operation. So the GRU hackers um, were the ones who broke into the DNC. They're the ones that spearfished 
John Podesta and stole mm -hmm. John Podesta's email. Mm -hmm. And then they took that information and because they now had leaked emails and leaked information, they had an incredibly potent tool to change the information environment in the United States. And so they pushed that leaked information to specific journalists that they thought would be vulnerable to manipulation. Those journalists wrote the stories they wanted of out of you know all of these emails they've stolen, we want to tell two or three stories mm -hmm. to hurt the Hillary Clinton campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and they leaked it to those journalists, the journalists wrote their stories, and then the other side of the GRU amplified those stories on social media and elsewhere. And then the third category was the part that is the most subtle and is perhaps the most um, scary for future elections, which is there was a campaign to break into the election systems of around 30 states. Mm. And in the end, it doesn't look like they did anything there. Um, and that could have been a, a dry run to see what kind of capabilities they have to break into these systems. Or in a alternate universe, that might have been effective. And, and my thesis here is I actually don't think the Russians thought Trump was going to win. I don't think even the Russian intelligence services are better than Nate Silver at, at, <laughs> at, at predicting elections. And if you look at you know the IRA was involved on both sides of trying to get Americans to hate each other. And the GRU activity was not pro-Trump activity, it was activity to hurt Hillary mm. and to create a crisis in her government from day one and a conflict between her and Congress uh, on day one. Um, and so there's an alternate universe, I think, where Hillary wins that night. If you remember a couple weeks before the election, Trump started dropping hints that it's all rigged, he's not gonna, right. he's not gonna concede. So, Hillary wins, Trump doesn't concede, the next day WikiLeaks or one of these personas the GRU has created could dump out, here are screenshots from inside the Nevada Secretary of State's office. Here's a database of voters that has been taken and manipulated from inside the Ohio Secretary of State's. Uh -huh. And they could have said, we are pro-Hillary hackers that we swung the election for her. Uh -huh. And what you would have had is the FBI saying, we're gonna investigate. And a week later, they would probably say, yes, there are, there's evidence that hackers were inside of all these networks. We don't know what they did. And you would have complete and total chaos, right? Wow. We'd end up in wow. a Bush v. Gore wow. situation. So those are kind of the three categories. And the first one is kind of what a lot of our focus was on, because that's one that happened mostly within social media. So all of that was going on, and yeah. Mark Zuckerberg said, ridiculous that we have any role in problems with the election. I'm not sure that's exactly what he said. Okay. I, so, Sarah, I mean, I, I, I don't like to be held responsible no, no, for I things that Mark Zuckerberg says because I don't own like a quarter of Kauai. <laughs> so like, if I was responsible for things that Mark said, if you gave me that much of Kauai, then I'd be well, cool with it. I guess right? the question but is, like, why do you, is, well, so, I mean, you're not Mark, but, right. I, I, but why would he initially dismiss the whole thing as, I, I don't think he said ridiculous, forget the word. No, I mean, I but think, I mean, it, it was really. I, mean, he, I think he believed that it was ridiculous to say that Facebook threw the election, okay. which is still an open, I don't think it's ridiculous to say it. I don't think he should have said that. Yeah. He was not at that time briefed on the fact that our team had been finding and stopping GRU activity since oh. the start of 2016, mm. right? So we had kind of an internal communication issue here of him not understanding all the stuff mm. that was happening. It's a big company. Um, but he shouldn't have said it, but it's also still an, I think, an open argument of the 20 things that happened in the last two months of the election, which of those are awaiting. Like there's two books that are coming out right now. And one of them, you know, from quantitative social scientists. Yeah. So they have two totally yeah. different uh, responses to that. So. Right. Um, but yes, I mean, he said it, and I don't think he should have. So, Facebook, certainly, I didn't think it was ridiculous, yeah, right? Like right. at that time, yeah. we were deep in this investigation, and we had already, already seen and shut down a bunch mm, of GRU stuff. Mm. So, what's happening now is this, it just escalated the, the misinformation, um, the spread of it online, especially th through social media. It it has uh, seemed, at least I think, to readers, people watching from the outside, that that Facebook and Google seem a little lost in how to handle it, at least publicly. Yeah. Um, what's your view? You've worked for both Yahoo and Facebook. Yeah, um, two they, very different companies. Two very different companies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do they want to fix it? Do they know how to fix it? Do they need help fixing it? Do they care? What, what it means, it matters what you mean by fix it, right? Yeah. And that's, I think that's part of the problem is defining what the problem space is here, okay. right? Um, do they want their platforms not to be used for foreign influence on elections? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do they want to be the, the arbiters of what is true? No, right? And one of the things you gotta think about when you think about the decision making processes of these companies is that they are staffed by Americans. They 
a lot of the thinking that goes into kind of the fundamental policy decisions is, is based upon a very American idea of, of what free speech is. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you and I can sit up here and criticize the current government and not worry about being disappeared from our beds tonight. 90% yeah. of Facebook's users are not American, right? Right. And of Facebook's two point, of the 2.2 billion people on Facebook platform and then 2.5 billion people on the, the family of apps, you know, my guess is that around half of those people either live in non-free countries or live in emerging democracies that do not have protection for speech. And so that's the other problem is that we, have, we take a very American view right. of what is fake news, what is the, the misinformation problem, but any solution that's put in place looks very, very different in Turkey or India or right. Thailand. And I think that's one of the things you see, it is true, the companies don't know exactly how to fix this, mm -hmm. right? And what you see from the outside is all of these different groups and equities, sometimes rising to the top and winning some battle, and then them falling behind and somebody else winning, right? And um, I think that's one of the problems the companies have, is that they're not working off of a consistent set of principles about mm -hmm. what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's all extremely reactive to whatever the last emergency is, and it mm -hmm. is not, uh, based upon some kind of reasonable, thoughtful process of these are the problems we're gonna work on and we're gonna set these other ones aside and we're gonna be public and transparent about that. Right. So we had talked a little earlier about, uh, and you just mentioned now that it's pre been pretty US focused, uh, mm -hmm. some of this, but um, some pretty uh, serious things have happened around the world, right? Yeah. Um, like um, fake, new, fake stories on WhatsApp in India, which then about child kidnappings, which then led to mobs to murder more than a dozen people a year, or Myanmar, yeah. where they doctored messages on Facebook, I understand, and, and to have fear and anxiety about the Muslim Rohingya group. I mean, what do these kind of international information campaigns that spread like wildfire, what can be done about those, and um, what places in the world are you most worried about? So those are two totally different yeah. problems, it yes. turns out, right? Mm -hmm. So the India problem is WhatsApp has become the dominant platform there for interpersonal communication. And for anybody who doesn't know what WhatsApp is, maybe Sorry, just tell, yeah. Well, yeah, because people in America, WhatsApp is, the, is, much is more basically the most popular chat app in the world, and not a lot of Americans use it. Yeah. So it does also show you kind of the future mm -hmm. is not American domination of the internet, and that this is an American company that belongs to Facebook now, but the vast majority of their users are outside the United States. Um, WhatsApp is a tool for uh, that started with chatting, then chatting in small groups, and can now do voice and video chat. But it's still a lot of it's used for texting and setting right. of, of. There's actually a, a decent number of WhatsApp users are functionally illiterate and use the app without being able to read and write, and so they send voice messages to oh. each other. Mm -hmm. So there's actually all these interesting emergent mm -hmm. properties of these mm -hmm. apps when they're used around the world. Mm -hmm. But WhatsApp is a tool for that. WhatsApp made this unprecedented decision a couple of years ago. So WhatsApp was bought by Facebook, and the two guys who founded WhatsApp were named Brian Acton and Jan Koum. They are actually Yahoo alumni. Mm -hmm. um, and they were super into privacy, and especially in the post Snowden era. And they had always been planning that they were going to encrypt WhatsApp chats so that those chats were outside of control of WhatsApp itself. Um, and after Facebook bought them, they made that decision and actually completed it, which is, probably the largest uplift in interpersonal privacy in the history of mankind wow. that like over a couple month period a billion people all of a sudden were able to talk to each other without governments or companies in this case facebook right. being able to see any of it so facebook sees none of those chats mm -hmm. facebook can't um moderate those in the same way facebook moderates the facebook app and instagram mm -hmm. and so what has happened in india and in brazil and a couple other places where WhatsApp is taken over is that the, the texture of misinformation looks very different. It's injected via true believers of political parties, and then those true believers amplify it and send it into groups. So like in India, people have groups of dozens or hundreds of people of their extended family and cousins and all that. And so a true believer in one of the parties, let's say the BJP, because mm -hmm. they're probably the most active in this, a true believer in the PJB, BJP and Hindu nationalism will send a Hindu nationalist anti-Muslim message that was fed to them via WhatsApp by somebody who works for the party, and they will 
amplify it and they will send it to all of the dozens of WhatsApp groups that they're part of. And then that will get amplified and then people will forward it and forward it. And so from WhatsApp's perspective, that is mostly opaque because all of that communication is encrypted. And, and so the WhatsApp problem is a really difficult privacy yeah. versus information integrity problem. Because mm -hmm. effectively, if you wanted to completely stop that, you'd have to one, drop encryption, yeah. and two, you'd have to build AI to spy on every single person's communications, okay. right? And so that, that becomes like a really creepy future versus the Myanmar problem, which is m much closer to kind of the Russian interference except it's domestic, that the Myanmar government themselves are running fake accounts and running profiles and then using it to push anti-Rohingya sediment. Right. Are there parts of the world that you're worried about? So when I think of the two elections I'm worried yeah. about next mm -hmm. year, the Indian election is probably absolutely number one, right? Um, it is a critical election in their history. Uh, it is uh, also, um, the BJP is both a major complainer about WhatsApp misinformation and they are also, it looks like the largest purveyor of wow. that. And so the call is coming from inside the house, which is not surprising for anybody here who's ever texted with an Indian teenager. It is a combination of in the Latin character set English, Hindi, Gujarati, Punjabi, like it is, you can see the future when you text with like a young person in India, but it is also completely opaque to, you, you can't just run it through Google Translate, right? It's not the kind of thing that it would be easy for a foreign mm. uh, country to influence, except maybe Pakistan. And if I was the Indians, I would be worried about Pakistan because of the shared languages and you know, shared movies and culture mm -hmm. that make that possible. Mm -hmm. But like, it would be very difficult to build like a information operation in the United States to target uh, in India because of that, that issue. Um, but it's because it's domestic and it's being pushed by people who are aligned to the parties. It also makes it, I think, in some ways much more dangerous because the messages are very finely tuned for the sentiments of very particular places in India. Mm -hmm. uh, and that makes it a, a, a really difficult problem to deal with. So India? And then probably the other election I'm most interested in is European parliamentary elections. Okay, because talk about that. Because yeah. there have been these massive right-wing victories in Poland and Hungary and then in the state level. Um, and there has yet to be an election where there has been kind of the populist alt-right, as we call it here, mm -hmm. exceed to the European Parliament. The Russians would absolutely love that. Like uh, the GRU activity is really targeted against the multinational institutions that pull Western countries together. They don't like NATO. They don't like the EU. They don't like the Five Eyes, the alliance the United States mm -hmm. has with our, our um, Anglophone allies. And so anything they can do to fissure those alliances they see a strength in their position mm -hmm. in the world. And so getting people elected from Italy, Hungary, Poland, maybe a couple other countries uh, where there's you know, regional parties that align with their interests, getting them to European Parliament would be a huge uplift. The other interesting thing is this will be the first major set of elections after the passing of GDPR. Um, which has a number of and maybe privacy. Say GDPR. For Sorry, uh, uh, okay. yeah, right. So GDPR is the General Data Privacy Regulation. It's a new, massive, overarching uh, renovation of European privacy law. There are two issues with it. One, nobody knows what it means yet, um, because the way this works in Europe is the European Commission passes this very generic language, and then that language is made real by 28 different national data protection authorities. And then in Germany, because of a historical artifact, they have 12 state data protection authorities that get to make their own interpretations. Wow. So um, that's fun for people. Um, <laughs> that's fine, that's just like a cost of regulation thing. The, the interesting thing about GDPR when it comes to elections is that it has a number of pro-privacy moves that can be weaponized. And because of some quirks in the relationship between European governments and US tech companies, specifically the inability to share data with the governments without the US government as an intermediary, um, there's a real risk of the abuse of GDPR, particularly a part called Article 17, by organized actors like the IRA or the GRU. And so it'll be interesting to see if they figure that out and are able to figure out how to weaponize privacy law on their behalf to make it difficult to do these investigations. One last election question, then I wanna yeah. turn to what you're doing here at Stanford. Uh, Brazil. Mm -hmm. So. What happened there? Was How was social media involved, do you think, in that? Right, so event? it's hard to know president. overall because what you get are these little snapshots from yeah. people who do research. Yeah. And um, the best research has been done by a university, the acronym of which is UMFG. I won't try to pronounce the name in Portuguese <laughs> and insult them. Um, but what they did is they built a project where their students infiltrated pro-Bolsonaro uh, right, pro groups and measured how much of the kind of image memes, the images 
you know, like here's an image and it'll have some text on it, right? Um, how much of, how many of those were, were misleading and it was something like 50%. So they did some work, but it's very hard because of the encrypted nature to understand how much reach that had and what the impact was. There was also people on the left who were pushing the same story. Okay. So that's one of the things we got to think about is you can, every political campaign for the rest of our lives um, is going to have an online component. So if you look at Facebook or WhatsApp or any social network, if you've decided that that is, that, that technology is evil, you can really justify that to yourself because you will only see the stuff that supports the other side. Mm. But the truth is, is right now in you know, the current election, Democratic candidates and Democratic groups have way more engagement on Facebook than the Republican side. There's a good New York Times article about this. Mm -hmm. And so you gotta be careful when you make these comparisons to mm -hmm. understand that there's two sides there. What, I mean, what happened with Bolsonaro, I'm not an expert in Portuguese, or I'm sorry, in Brazilian, um, uh, uh, history, you know, they've, they have this history of like a military dictatorship. Um, mm -hmm. They have a huge crime problem, people looking for the, the big brother figure, yeah. and he won by 10%. So this was not a Trump-like victory of losing the popular vote and winning by uh, a technicality. Yeah. This was like a resounding victory. Yeah. Um, and my message to people in Brazil around things like WhatsApp encryption is you gotta be real careful in that, you know, Bolsonaro had a lot of corporations behind him, people who own newspapers, people who own TV stations. The fact that WhatsApp is encrypted, which because of WhatsApp being encrypted, the head of the Brazilian office of Facebook has been arrested twice already because Facebook has not dropped encryption to give data to the Brazilian state. Wow. The fact that the Brazilian state, which Bolsonaro now controls, he has the intel agencies, he has the federal prosecutor's office, he has the federal national police of Brazil are under his control. The fact that they do not have access to people's personal communications is gonna be one of the only asymmetries that is somewhat evened out and it's by an American tech company. So there's like this weird dystopian future thing yeah. going on here. And we gotta be real careful about assigning blame to private communication for this kind of stuff. Because I think mm -hmm. that in the long run, you don't beat the powerful by giving more governments and more corporations control over people's speech, right? right. Yeah. I just know I have a lot of friends in Brazil who are very worried right now. Right, and I think they yeah. should be. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, he is. I mean, he says horrible, crazy stuff. And like, we've lived through two years of Trump, and the things he says is shocking. It's Bolsonaro serious. is shocking even yeah. after that. It so is. it's it's unbelievable. I mean, my hope is I don't really understand. My hope is that there's still some institutional, you know, breaks on his ability to enact. I mean, and also, you know, every Brazilian president in the last couple of years ends up getting indicted for corruption. So like, maybe so he won't make it. He, maybe, he, maybe <laughs> they will, yes. Maybe they'll have a level of instability that generally is bad, but in this case might Could keep him from, from, you know, putting a truly fascist state in place. Right. So you come to Stanford now, so uh, with the intent to improve the security and safety of the internet. Just a small, tiny job. Yeah. Um, what can you do from your perch at, Stanford, perch at Stanford that you could not do while you were at Facebook? That's a good question. I, it was, it was great to, how do I say this? I am glad I, people would ask me, do you like your job when I was at Facebook? And my answer would be, I'm glad I'm in it, which is different <laughs> than I like my job, right? Um, and yeah. there is a benefit of being on the outside of one, being able to think about these ideas, not just an emergency, right? Like I, I see now my friends on that side um, who are still there, who are jumping from critical emergency to critical emergency, and they're never able to take a step back, right? Mm -hmm. So I have the mm -hmm. ability of having some of that experience and now being able to, to chill a little bit and not get a call at 2 a.m. that a child's been kidnapped or that you know, somebody's been arrested by the secret police in Thailand. So you which get are to kind go, of get to go get. trick or treating with your kids tomorrow for, night. Yes, for the first time in like four <laughs> years, I get to actually go trick or treating. I was in Africa one year getting yelled at. Um, uh, you know, yes, it was, that is nice, yeah. but yeah. Um, and so I do have the ability to kind of think about that kind of stuff. I think the other thing we've got to do in academia is, you know, I come from a very traditional information security background, right? Like I was a, effectively a teenage hacker, Berkeley double E, studied computer security academically, worked professionally. I started a company of professional hackers. But then when I got to Yahoo and then especially Facebook, it became readily apparent that the, um, vast majority of bad things that happen to people online have no interesting technical component, right? <laughs> They're not related to all of the sexy security bugs that those of us in the security industry are interested in. They are because of what is termed abuse, 
which is the technically correct use of technology to cause harm. Mm -hmm. They are the bullying and harassment of everybody, but especially women, especially minorities. Mm -hmm. They are teenagers telling each other to commit suicide mm -hmm. on Instagram. The sexual abuse of children, which is actually the worst thing that happens any day on the internet and nobody ever talks about it. But it's just like a horrible background mm -hmm. level of horrible li of lives being destroyed. And that happens all the time and it's not an area that people talk about. Mm -hmm. Even though these companies have huge teams working on it. Mm -hmm. and so. There is no academic discipline that studies that. For information security, computer science departments study it. But they, they're really, you know, you don't get a PhD in computer science for studying spamming or phishing because it's not technically sophisticated enough. And so one of the things I'm trying to do here at Stanford is to create a center where we can pull people from dis different disciplines and work on it. And there's a computer science component. There are people from communications. There are people from psychology. Uh, area studies, right? So for mm -hmm. example, one of the things we want to do is have a project to look, it's to examine the misuse of WhatsApp in the Indian election. Mm -hmm. And that's going to require computer science students to build the technology that allows us to collect up information from all over the place. It's mm -hmm. going to require you know, people from the Southeast Asia Center who mm -hmm. understand Indian politics. It's going to require the fact that we have this incredibly diverse student body so we can pay mm -hmm. research assistants to sit in their dorm rooms and to translate <laughs> tweets for us. Like I said, mm -hmm. like there's no way we can't run through Google Translate the stuff that people say on WhatsApp in India. Um, and so uh, those are the kinds of things that hopefully we can do in academia. And what I, one of the things we can do is, you're right, the companies don't know what they're doing. Right, and they're making it up as they go along. Mm -hmm. And from the company side, they feel like they're besieged. No matter what they do, they're gonna get blamed, right? Like if they don't censor enough, they get blamed. And if they censor too much, they get blamed. And there's no way out. Mm -hmm. And part of the problem is there's not an infrastructure around the decision-making processes that are happy at the companies. Mm. Um, and effectively, all of the important policy reactions of 2016 have happened inside of Facebook, Google, and Twitter. Congress has done nothing. Right? The United States Congress has done nothing. Yeah. The executive branch has done close to nothing to protect 2018. Those companies have defined what is political advertising. They have defined the transparency rules around political advertising. They've defined the level of, of the standard that you have to meet. They've, they have built information sharing agreements between each other. Do we None want of that. that to happen? Well, I, th I think oh, I so. I guess we want someone to do it. Well, somebody's got to do it. Right. None of it's legally required. And they're just making up as they go along. And unlike when Congress makes a decision and there's think tanks writing papers and there's lobbyists coming in to lobby for their side, they're just kind of inventing it. And I think in the academics world, we can take a step back and we can think about what do we want these people to do? What are the principles that we want? What is the kind of transparency we want? And we can build an intellectual framework within which people at Facebook and Google and Twitter and all these other companies can make decisions that uh, you know, they want to have the help to do that I correctly. I say, do they want that help? And do you oh, think I think so, listen? absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, and they're absolutely desperate for it right now. Because right now, no matter what decision they make, they, they take a lot of crap from people. And that, that gets a little frustrating and it becomes like a bunker mentality. I think mm -hmm. they want some external, if there was some external discussion of this is a reasonable set of trade-offs in these areas and they can adapt, well, we're going to try to follow these reasonable set of trade-offs as from this group of academics, I think they'd be very open to that kind of stuff. And that's something that we can do at Stanford in a way that other companies or uh, universities can't because we're so close to the companies. Because we have the connections there, we have Hoover in DC, and so we can serve as a bridge between I think these, these different groups in a way that nobody is serving right now. So you seem very passionate about these issues. What drives you to do this work? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the reason I got into security is the puzzle aspect, right? Mm -hmm. It's really fun to hack into stuff. It's really fun to look at a big complex system and to break it. And I did that for years and that was great. And then I realized like, it's easy to break stuff. It's a lot harder to defend stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, terrorists can blow up buildings. They can't design them and build them themselves, <laughs> right? And I think that's one of the switches we have to make in the security world is, is to have as much emphasis on the building and the protection side. But then, you know, I, I, I took the job at Yahoo because I wanted to have some direct consumer impact. And it turns out the world's way worse than I thought, right? Like, mm -hmm. the, we just, in Silicon Valley, we don't build technologies that are safe for people to use every day. We don't build safe tech the way Toyota builds safe cars. You know, if anybody in this room goes and clicks on a link and gets tricked into giving up their password the same way John Podesta did. John Podesta, the man who was the White House Chief of Staff and had a right. top secret SCI clearance and who was incredibly yeah. paranoid. Yeah. If anybody in this room fell for that, what the companies would say was like, oh, user error, that's your problem. 
But if you drive your car into a highway median at 20 miles per hour, it doesn't just explode and burn you to death, right? Like that, you can't, Toyota can't just be like, well, you know, you really shouldn't run into walls, right? <laughs> like, we, but that's how we act in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And I think it really, that really makes me angry that we don't build technology that is safe for people by default or safe in the way that they use it. We build stuff that's secure, if used perfectly, sometimes. We never build stuff that is safe for normal people, and I think that's just a massive failing on behalf of the industry, and it takes people from the industry, I think, to affect that change. So two last questions for me, and then we'll have some questions from the audience. Um, one, what keeps you up at night? And two, where do you see hope? Um, I mean, I feel like the truth is, 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 as a society, we're never going to we're never going back to the Walter Cronkite era, right? And that is kind of implied, we'll see from the, the, the next panel, but that's kind of implied when I talk to a lot of journalists and people that work in journalism, is that the truth is, is we're living through this crazy transition in that we had this mass media era, which was honestly unique, right? Mm -hmm. Radio, television, newspapers in everybody's homes. From all of human history, the ability for a small number of people to communicate with millions of people is actually a artificial mm -hmm. time, right? Like, people used to be illiterate, right? And there used to be no information that you didn't get directly from other people for tens of thousands of years. And then, you know, we have this strange time of the mass media era when 50 middle-aged white guys decided what was newsworthy, right? And that there seems to be kind of a, you know, there's a number of people who kind of want to go back to the era. They can't say that, but that is implied in their goal of like talking about what social media has done and stuff. The truth is the, the marginal cost of moving information has gone to zero. It no longer costs any money to move information around the world. Right. That means there is no more newspaper oligopolies. There are no more TV oligopolies. There will never again be an information oligopoly. So you could wipe out Facebook, Twitter, Google, all those companies, and nothing changes because the fundamental fact is billions of people have the ability to move information. Other people will rise up into their place. And so you just have to kind of accept that and move past, like how, do, as a society, do we live in a world where there are no longer any gatekeepers? And there never will be. Or if there are, they're horribly, I mean, there are places with gatekeepers, like the People's Republic of China, right? Like, it's, we're now in a place where if you have those gatekeepers, it becomes an incredible me mechanism of control. And I'm really worried about a couple things. I'm worried, can our society survive in that world where anybody can run a newspaper, anybody can be a TV station? There are upsides. Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, things that were totally valid problems 30 years ago, but nobody talked about it because the editors of CBS News, ABC News, NBC News, CNN, the New York Times, the LA Times were all middle-aged white men and that was not a problem for them, right? But in a world where everybody has a pocket supercomputer that is also a TV truck, those kinds of, and the ability to broadcast that around the world, those kinds of problems can be things our society deals with. So that's what makes me hopeful is that there are these positive kind of grassroots from the bottom movements and emergent things that are actually positive. How do we have those while also then not having these crazy populist movements take advantage of it? Um, and I'm just, I am, I am worried about us not figuring that out and I'm worried about an overreaction where we end up building levers of control. Like I think this is where I differ from some of my other progressive friends. Um, there's a lot of people on kind of the center left that I agree with politically in a lot of ways, who are very excited to control the speech of other people, right? Or to control the, the information consumption habits of mm -hmm. other people, specifically Trump voters, right? Is, and <laughs> my fear is that we create these levers and a future populist who is smarter and more effective than Trump gets their hands on it. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so my message to people when they think about these controls is give Silicon Valley companies the power you would give them, not with Mark Zuckerberg and Sundar Pinchai running them. Like Mark is a socially progressive millennial from Long Island, right? Imagine Peter Thiel, the Austrian ubermensch, who believes the world was better when women couldn't vote and who you know, sued Gawker out of existence. Think about him running one of those companies. What kind of powers to define journalism, to mm -hmm. define fake news, to control people's speech yeah. would you want to have in his hands? And that's, that's like, you know, we can imagine a world where people we agree with make these rules up, but the truth is, is not only people we agree with are gonna have their hands on those levers, so we gotta be real careful creating those levers in the first place. Okay, 
Okay. We have got a few questions here. Tim Cook called for our version of GDRR. Would it happen or was it disingenuous? Um, I think Tim completely agrees it would be better if his uh, corporate competitors had their, uh, their business models kneecapped. I, I do believe Tim <laughs> thinks that is a positive thing. <laughs> but I, I think what's happened is in the United States, we have completely, um, we don't have a competent privacy regulator in the same way European countries do. The Federal, Tra Federal Trade Commission has privacy regulation, but they can only do so in the context of an unfair business practice or a deceptive business practice. So effectively, they go around suing companies that lie about their privacy protections, which just incentivize companies to have terms of service that say, we can do anything to screw you with your data whenever <laughs> we want, right? And they're like, well, it wasn't deceptive. And like, because the United States does not have a functioning privacy regulatory system, we have created this vacuum the Europeans have stepped into, and the Europeans are not very good at passing law about tech. Mm -hmm. They do not have very technically sophisticated people in the European Commission. The European Commission is not very democratically accountable, and there's a massive problem of the European Commission not having national security responsibility. And so what the state governments are asking tech companies to do is completely incompatible with what the European Commission is asking them to do, mm -hmm. right? And so we could do better in America, I think, we should pass our own GDPR, but with a single privacy regulator who defines what it, what it means, a single set of rules across the entire United States, and taking in all of those equities. Um, and I think that would then reduce the chance of Europe controlling where we're going, because the Europeans pretty clearly don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So the Facebook annual report notes that as the controlling stock- Somebody typed that up while we were sitting yes. here? Wow. <laughs> I don't know what they're printing on. Mark Zuckerberg can vote his shares in his own interests, which may not always be in the interest of st our stockholders generally, is a quote. In effect, this means he could pursue policies at Facebook that facilitate the operation of democracy in the U.S., even if it did not maximize long-run profits at Facebook. Do you think he should devote even more resources to making democracy work in the U.S.? And if so, what would you advise him to do? So I feel like that's two parts. So in the latter, the thing I said in the draw lecture that I think has been a huge failure of the tech companies is finding a sustainable model for journalism, especially local journalism in the 21st yes. century, Yes. right? We're moving to this subscription model that's working fine for the New York Times and the Washington Post. But one, that doesn't work for, you know, I'm from Sacramento. The Sacramento Bee is the sad shell of what it mm -hmm. used to be. Right, like it's all stories from other, it's just incredibly sad to go yeah. home and to read the bee, which doesn't even get delivered on like Monday through Wednesday or something. It's, yeah. it's incredibly bad. And this is a, you go to Estonia, Estonia is 1.3 million people, so that's about the size of Sacramento County. They have like five daily newspapers in Estonia, mm -hmm. right? Like you're like, <laughs> how is it that we can't do this in the United States? And um, uh, so like we, the tech companies have to find a model that is not subscription based because the other thing we're doing with subscriptions is you're gonna end up with rich people getting good journalism yeah. and everybody else is reading Breitbart, right? And that is not a good future of like a small number of people with Wall Street Journal, New York Times and Washington Post subscriptions being the only people who are exposed to like that kind of good journalism. Right. On the first one, on Mark voting the shares, I don't think that's a correct statement of the rules. I'm actually really, afraid of a future where there's a shareholder revolt against Mark. And it's because I worked at a tech company, Yahoo, that had an activist investor. And during that period of time, the company did everything it can to make Wall Street happy. And a tech company making Wall Street happy is completely orthogonal to a tech company living up to its security, safety, and privacy pr promises, mm. right? Like in the middle of finding Russians, I have people being laid off on my team, right? Um, which is eventually why I had to go. Like I, you can't fix stuff when that's the context in which you're Why operating. were people, I, I missed that. Why were people la being laid off from your team? Because midway through our CEO's tenure, she picked up active investors who cared all about the short-term revenue, oh. right? And so like they were cutting employees from, okay. from Yahoo very, very quickly. And so oh, Yahoo. Mark is beyond yeah. money. Yes. He doesn't care. Like again, he owns a big chunk of, like he's gonna, he's gonna be, him and Priscilla are gonna be the Astors or the Rockefellers of the Bay mm -hmm. Area. Like people are gonna go to Zuckerberg Hospital next to Zuckerberg Place and take the, the Zuckerberg High Line, and you know, yeah. like they're at that stage. Yeah. He cares about his historical legacy. Yeah, that is good. I would hate for there to be a CEO of Facebook that cares about making the quarterly numbers good, because that would be, I think, mm -hmm. a, a terrifying thing. And so the fact that Mark has that control, I think, is a temporary respite. 
that kind of control has never really been tested. We've never ended up in a situation where you've got like the vanguards and the fidelities and the other people who actually own Facebook, you know, revolt against the owner, you know, uh, founder control. Um, and in a world where there's a CEO who's just pumping the, the stock, I think a lot of the investment that needs to be happen would not happen. Why were hackers able to recently harvest the private data of nearly 100 million Facebook users? So hackers were able to get to some profile information on 39 million okay. users because they found a security flaw that was actually in a privacy feature. It was a privacy feature that let you see how your profile looked like somebody else. So that's called impersonation in software. It is a very, very dangerous thing. And there was three security bugs that you could put together that they could get a token that let them then see other parts of your profile, but not all of it. Um, they were able to do that because software is fallible, mm -hmm. because it is created by humans, and humans are fallible, born of man and mortal. Um, I don't, uh, you know, Facebook probably has the third most sophisticated software security program in tech after Microsoft and Google, uh, and still, you're, when you write hundreds of millions of lines of code, you're gonna end up having bugs like that. So just uh, sort of spinning off of that, so it's my understanding, this questioner says, there's no way to fix the problem with total security on Facebook or Yahoo, et cetera. When starting company, these companies, were they naive to assume they would not need security or was it about financial gains and worldwide usage that was the driving force? So I don't think any companies think they don't need, any of these companies think they don't need security. That is a standard problem in Silicon Valley is people don't build security until they have their first incident. Um, mm -hmm. The Yahoo issue is Yahoo has been dying for 10, 12 years. And so seeing a, just like when a huge star dies, it causes a lot of damage yeah. to the, the, the stellar neighborhood. It is really when a tech company that has the information of hundreds of millions of people dies, it has a humongous blast radius. And that's the Yahoo story. On the Facebook side, I think on the safety issues, the growth mindset was a problem, right? That, that Facebook mm -hmm. expanded much more quickly than it could handle the issues. On the security side, very few companies have, have put as much money into secure software development as Facebook has, and still there are going to be flaws. And I'm not sure what to say about that other than, you know, the trade-off there is not really about money, but about the quick, you know, with the speed at which you develop certain feature sets and you roll right. those out. And I think that's the balance that they're probably rethinking now is on the um, development speed versus, um, some of the software security stuff that might slow down that pipeline. Mm -hmm. Let's see, so many questions. Let me see if I Any can other typed one. ones? Because I feel like we should give precedent <laughs> to people, somebody who brought a laser printer <laughs> to a... Uh, <laughs> now, if Facebook is just a platform, what is its lifespan? Won't people eventually move on, like all of my nieces and nephews almost all the time? Um, what yeah. then? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 101 is littered by the bleach skulls of all the companies that have come before. Um, so I think that is one of the silly things of people that talk about like, you know, these companies lasting forever. They have these life cycles where they get big or smaller and they merge and the products change. Um, I think what Mark has tried to do up to this point is to see competitors, this is probably his superpower of all of the things he's able to do as CEO is he's been really, really good at seeing emerging competitors and then buying them while they're still affordable. He bought Instagram for like a couple billion dollars and that's worth a hundred billion on their own now. He bought WhatsApp for like, I think it ended up being in the 20 to $22 billion range because it was bought with stock. Pocket and fluctuates. change, yeah. Yeah, which seemed like a huge <laughs> amount of money at the time and now yeah. everybody's like, that was the smartest decision he's yeah. ever made. Uh, now, how does Facebook continue to do that in the current antitrust environment, which I think will prevent them from ever buying a a uh, social network of scale, I don't know. And so like, I think from his perspective, he now has to have that kind of creativity organically or Facebook's gonna have to, uh, like Facebook could not buy Snapchat. So effectively the company copied Snapchat's product and crushed Snapchat um, under the wheels of Instagram. And so whether or not they're able to continue to do that at a speed at which they do not become a bleached skull is a question. Right. So you gave a lecture called the Drell Lecture a few weeks ago and you talked about, you were quoted as saying, our society will not be healthy if we don't have a good economic model for journalism. And um, that, that somehow um, nobody wanted to destroy the newspaper industry, you said, but there's a consequence, this was a consequence of allowing people to be journalists and take away things like classified advertising economics. Yeah. Is it Silicon Valley Tech Company's job to fix the economic model of journalism? I, I don't think, 
like in a big picture kind of like moral ethical, it's not their job. Mm -hmm. I think practically if the companies want to not be destroyed by the rest of society, they have to, right? Like it, it, it you know. What should it, they do? I, I think we're, we're probably gonna have to, so one of the real challenges here is the advertising model has this incredible benefit of a small number of consumers in rich countries subsidize the creation of these of these platforms that reach billions of people, right? So like Facebook released their quarterly numbers today. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the exact number, but I'm guessing the APRU, which is the or ARPU, average revenue per user, which okay. is the amount of money Facebook makes per user, okay. in North America is something like in the $25 range. Every year, every American Facebook user worth 25 bucks. In Africa, it's like a dollar, right? So people in Africa, have access to all of these platforms because there are people who click ads and buy stuff in Europe, North America, and the rich parts of Asia. Okay. And so the question is, is how do you build a model that replicates some of that without it being, the, like the advertising model's not working for journalism. The subscription model, like I said, one, it creates a two-class society within classes, and then globally it creates a huge class difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so how do you replicate that kind of model where you can support people creating content all around the world. I think maybe it's a micropayment model. Um, maybe it is through advertising, but via shared revenue. I mean, I feel like it's not gonna be the advertising model, honestly, because mm -hmm. um, the value per user is not big enough and uh, driving value out of advertising. If you have to make more, that means violating people's privacy more. And I think that's just the direction that we're not gonna go and we shouldn't go. Um, and so, I, it's probably gonna be like something like a Spotify model, right? Like you pay Spotify, whatever, 15 bucks a month. Spotify for news. Yes, and people play, you know, they, you play a Lana Del Rey track, she gets one cent, right? Um, and in aggregate, the amount of money, same with Netflix, Netflix collects billions and billions of dollars per year, and then they divvy it out to the content that's played the most. And I think we might have to have a model like that there's a number of companies working on that. I don't think any of the small companies will ever be able to do it because they just don't have the scale. Really, Google, Amazon, Facebook are probably the only three companies that could fix that problem. Okay, so we'll be back in touch with you about that. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> so I want to thank Alex Stamos for tonight and thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, that's great, appreciate it. Thank you for being on the journey with us this month and for being here for this final pal uh, panel. Alex and Don discussed platforms, misinformation, and the effect on the news and information ecosystem around the world. Now our final guests will discuss some of the actions news organizations are taking or can take to counter misinformation and to rebuild your trust. Our moderator this evening is a 2019 JSK Fellow. She's seated in the center. Um, it is Mandy Jenkins. She was the first editor-in-chief at Storyful, where she oversaw a team that worked with newsrooms to find, verify, and publish eyewitness media and social insights from around the world. She is president of the Online News Association's Board of Directors. To your left, Dr. Meredith Clark. Dr. Clark is a former journalist and an assistant professor in the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia. Her research focuses on the intersections of race, media, and power, and she has done deep research into social media communities and their attitudes on trust and the media. Seated next to Dr. Clark is Sally Lehrman. Sally is Senior Director of the Journalism Ethics Program at the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. She leads the Trust Project, an international collaboration to strengthen public confidence in the news. Many uh, news organizations, as well as the platforms, such as Google and Facebook, are participants in that. Uh, she is also a 1996 alumna of the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships. Seated next to Mandy on the other side is Aaron Sharakman. Aaron is the executive director of PolitiFact, the largest fact-checking organization in the United States, which won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting in 2009 for its coverage of the 2008 presidential election. If you've seen the truth o meter measuring the truth of stories, PolitiFact is the organization that gives you that. And uh, seated next to Aaron is Lynn Walsh. 
Lynn is project manager for a project called Trusting News, an initiative at the University of Missouri, which tests strategy for improving the trust readers have in news organizations. She serves on the national board for the Society of Professional Journalists and served as president in 2016, 2017. That's your panel for the evening and your final panel for the class. Take it away, Mandy. Thanks, Michael. So as we've seen over the course of, of this class these past few weeks, there are lots of obstacles standing between journalists and the public that used to be the audience. Uh, the, we have economic forces that are squeezing local newsrooms. We have crackdowns on freedom around the world. And now we also have bad actors using the tools of mass media to spread disinformation. But sometimes the barrier is all of these things and none of these things at the same time. It's a failing of trust between newsrooms and their audiences, and between people and the institutions that they used to trust a long time ago. And that's our focus for this panel tonight. So in 1976, Gallup found that 72% of Americans had confidence in the news media. And since that time, the trust in journalism has plummeted. So I wanna start with Sally, here to my right. Um, you've done research on how the audience <laughs> interacts with the news and has seen some of this over time. So how did we get here? How do we get to this place right now? Boy, there's a question. <laughs> um, so I think back to 1997 when um, actually the Seeds of the Trust Project began. And I um, gathered together a group of editors and we were thinking about, well, what is it that, um, what kind of journalism ethics, ethics should we be thinking about in this digital era? And I heard a lot from them right at that moment, so this was you know, 20 plus years ago, uh, about their concerns that the digital environment was degrading the quality of the news and was degrading um, the ethics of news. And you know, fast forward 20 years and I came to Santa Clara University and uh, had a faculty position and we brought together a similar group of editors from around the US and they were talking about the same thing. And so I thought, well, we really, shouldn't be talking about this anymore. We should be trying to figure out what's wrong and find a way to address it. And their concern at that time and you know, four years ago when I brought the same kinds of people back together was again that these, the, the digital environment that we were just hearing about was really supporting um, clicks. It was supporting the worst of journalism because everyone was out there rushing to get the clicks, was rushing to write the kind of headlines that would grab people's emotions and maybe setting aside some of their ethics for that reason. So I was thinking, can't we use, flip the picture and use uh, the digital environment towards supporting the, um, the greater good or the kinds of good that journalism really does? And so journal, this, I, this problem of trust in the news is not new, as you said, it was data dating back to the 70s. I believe that a lot of it did start or it worsened with the digital environment and these editors were really seeing that this was going to happen. And now, of course, we have these incredible forces, we've seen it mass manifest, incredible forces of misinformation, of um, still the clickbait problem. We have uh, increasing uncertainty on the part of the public because of the misinformation and all the, um, as you're getting two thirds of new people or people are getting two thirds of their news on, from social or search today. So they're not seeing the brand necessarily, or you're not seeing the brand, you're, you're going right to an article and you don't necessarily know where it's coming from and it looks exactly like all other kinds of information. So of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about where is this coming from. And then finally, there are deliberate efforts to undermine uh, the public's faith in the news. Now, um, the other piece, of course, is that journalism has not always done right by the public and we do make a lot of mistakes. And there are populations that we have not covered well at all for a long time. So combine all these forces in the digital environment with the um, problems that have been within the process of journalism for some time, the business model declining, and now we've got a really bad um, toxic equation. So what we did was, um, as I was thinking about, well, how do we flip the picture? Where do we begin to address this trust project? I thought, well, we can't keep talking among journalists. It's time to go out and really talk to the public. And so inspired, in fact, by what I learned here at Stanford, um, coming back as an alum to the Knight Fellowship Program, um, 
we did empathy interviews with the public and went one on one with people and asked them across Europe and the US, across race, class, gender, generation, and geography, what is it you value in the news? When do you trust it? And when don't you? And out of that, to me, came some encouraging um, discoveries. And I'll just tell you what they briefly what they are, and then we'll, I'll let you ask some more questions. But the, so we were able to find four user types. And one is, is the avid news user, and that's probably many of you in the room. And those are people that are out there checking and cross-checking the news, um, and then pushing it out through your networks to help um, guide others. Then there's an engaged news user who is interested in the news, maybe subscribes, talks about it with friends and family, but is a little bit overwhelmed and uncertain. Then we have the opportunistic, who is the type of person who just doesn't have time to pursue the news. And so it's just why they're there when it washes over them, maybe in the break room, um, it's on the television, or it's, uh, they get a notification on their phone. And then the angry and disengaged, and those are the ones that we worry about most in journalism. The part that I feel is encouraging is that, um, number one, across all those groups, there was a um, lots of expression that news matters. It's just, um, from the angry, disengaged point of view, well, it matters to us, but we don't think it's doing a good job. And then across the middle, there was a lot of uncertainty about what to trust or not. So I feel that we can, through, through things like what we're doing in the, at the Trust Project, we can engage those avid folks to help people down the line. And so it, what we do is provide these trust indicators to the public, and I'll tell you more about them later, but essentially provide the tools to help people know who and what is behind the news so that each group can help the other to do a better job of really becoming an informed news user. Thanks, Sally. Thanks for uh, giving us the foundation for, for where we're starting off from here today. And actually, that's a great seg. Uh, Lynn, I wanted to ask you, you know, in trusting news, you, know, you guys are do a lot, especially when we're talking about research into transparency, media literacy. You know, what are some findings that you guys have found in, in your work so far uh, about essentially how, the, how we've been talking here with Sally? Yeah, so at the Trusting News Project, we work directly with newsrooms. So these are local newspapers, local television stations, online-only news organizations. And with their help, we were able to talk to their audiences, so people like you who might read the newspaper, watch the news. Um, and what we found is that primarily, uh, they, people said, news consumers, said that they want ethical, responsible journalism. They want journalism that is going to show opposing viewpoints. They want journalism that's going to show context. They want journalism that is going to include multiple sources. Um, and they, you know, there were some outliers on there that said, you know, some of, most of journalism bi is biased. But for the most part, people wanted journalism, just good, ethical, responsible journalism. And the things that they said that they wanted, um, what's interesting about it is they're things that journalists are already doing day to day. So when we get a story, we're making multiple calls. You may only see that one person on TV that we talk to, or you may only see one quote in the newspaper, but there were multiple people that we talked to. So that's just one example. So what we're trying to do at the Trusting News Project is because journalists are doing what the public wants them to do to be responsible and to be responsible journalists, but we're, journalists are doing a lousy job basically of showing the public how we do those things and that we even do those things. So we're working directly with journalists to get them to explain more about how our process works, talk and be very, very specific about what is news, what is opinion, um, also being very careful to not use journalism jargon in everyday reporting. Um, so basically just to be more transparent with everything that we're doing so that the public is very aware that we are doing these things that you want us to do. And the goal is that um, if they know that we're doing this, can we meet at a point then to then talk about the content that we're sharing? instead of having these, misassum these assumptions that are made that generally are negative. Thank you. I definitely want us to return to that concept of a transparency and media literacy a little bit later. Um, but I want to shift for a second, because we talk about the public, and that's, that's a lot of people. That's a pretty wide, uh, wide look at that. But I'd like to, to shift a look at some specific audiences we're talking about trust. Um, so Dr. Clark, you've done some really great work looking at social media subcultures and minority communities. And I really like to know how does it disconnect between what's discussed in those communities and then what is reported in mainstream media about those communities affecting the trust there? Mm -hmm. 
Some of the things I've seen, I study um, specifically one Twitter subculture called Black Twitter, and Black Twitter is comprised of black users of Twitter who use the service in a very distinct way, one that's easily surveilled online. Um, the way that black Twitter users use the platform to communicate with one another is heavily influenced by culture and cultural references. It is embedded with symbolic meaning, um, and it has context that is often missing from news stories. Some of the problems that we've heard about historically have to do with a lack of coverage of certain communities, including black communities. And so some of the things that you see black Twitter doing is that in the coverage that is deficient of the backstory, the context, the history that you would want to see in journalism about your community, black Twitter provides for one another. So how much, and kind of following up on that, you know, how much is sort of the, the culture within you know, the, these communities on social media, uh, I guess somewhat in conflict with the lack of diversity in newsrooms covering that same community? Well, I, I would definitely say that there is a correlation between the two. Um, I am currently running the American Society of News Editors Newsroom Diversity Survey, which was initially developed in 1968, 10 years after the Kerner Commission report came out and made this indictment of national news media for failing to cover black communities in particular adequately and fairly. And since 1978, the survey has tracked the number of journalists of color in different newsrooms across the country and also of women in newsrooms across the country. And some of the things that we've seen is that since about 2012, there's been kind of a plateauing of the number of journalists of color in these newsrooms. So what we're seeing online in these social media spaces in making up for those deficiencies is providing news that the people who are absent from the newsrooms can't. Some of the reporting that you've seen from places like Ferguson on the ground coming directly from social media activists, uh, some of the things that you've seen in terms of breaking down social media movements like the Black Lives Matter movement as they unfurl has come through these communities on Twitter. So it's people who are able to, because of their access to the platforms, the speed of the platforms, and their knowledge of very specific and specialized subjects, are able to do some sort of reporting that is different than what we get from mainstream media. Thank you. So you know, when we're, uh, we're talking about trusted news organizations, and I think that probably is one of those things that depends on who you ask, I'm sure, from what we know here in this room versus maybe some other people out there. Uh, we know what it is that we trust. Now, PolitiFact is often on that list, and, and so is Snopes. I know my mom, who is a big not truster of media, especially considering I'm in the media, uh, <laughs> but she loves Snopes. She calls it Snoops. <laughs> she will send everything to Snoops to make sure it's real. And uh, PolitiFact it really has been a big mover in that space as well, especially when it pertains to political news. So, Erin, I'm, I'm interested to hear from you. You know, is, is it the case that PolitiFact's really trusted? Do you guys still kind of get charged with, with being the fake media these days? Sure, yes. Uh, well, first, thanks for having me. Uh, and since 2016, fact-checking is kind of in vogue. And so I get in to, uh, invited to a lot of these panels. This is the first one where I'm the only guy on the stage. And so <laughs> kudos to Michael and, yes, and Don for ready. putting together a diverse panel. That's excellent. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, so we just fact checked a claim by Ted Cruz earlier this week or last week. Uh, he had claimed uh, that since the president's tax cut bill had passed, tax revenues have gone up. And he was saying that this is evidence that the tax cuts are working. Uh, more people are having more money in their pocket, and still yet um, more monies are coming into the federal uh, bank. Um, the facts of this are uh, nominally, yes, there's a little bit more money that the government is taking in, but by every kind of actual important measure, um, it's the lowest growth in revenues in the federal, uh, to the federal treasury in, in decades when you adjust for inflation. It's actually down, things like that. So. We rated that claim half true. And when we published the claim, we said half true. It's the number is nominally up, but when you kind of really peel back the layers of the onion, you'll find uh, a lot of problems with this. Ted Cruz gets on Twitter and says, 
liberal lion politifact uh, out to get me again. They literally said revenues have gone up and they still say half true. How could they? 10 minutes later, Paul Krugman, New York Times, you'd probably consider him a progressive, a liberal. I really don't agree with PolitiFact on this one. They were way too easy on Ted Cruz. <laughs> I kind of take that as a badge of honor on both sides and say maybe we're in the right place. But the point is, when it comes to politics uh, and in the partisan space we're in right now, uh, it is very difficult, I think, for anyone to truly trust anything. At PolitiFact, we try every day to be as transparent and as fair and objective as possible. Um, we were probably, and I could be wrong on this, but as far as I know, when we started in 2007, we were probably the first uh, website to literally have a bibliography with every newspaper article we wrote that listed every source uh, we considered, every source we talked to, whether or not they were included in the final article. Uh, we had hyperlinks to all of our uh, source material. Um, I'm told this is terrible for SEO, but I really like uh, a paragraph that says something like, if you want to see the report, click here. Um, we do that so you can read it. Uh, we try uh, uh, in everything we do to be as transparent as possible so you can help um, uh, make decisions about who you're going to vote for, what policies you stand for. Um, that all adds up to still we're trusted a little bit and sometimes not so much. Um, uh, after the 2016 election, we did a lot of kind of soul searching and found that there are truly pockets of people who defend us. And maybe some of you guys are here. and Thank you. Um, but then there are, thank you. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of people who, who uh, try to discredit our work um, and do it for political gain. And so we are still looking, uh, trust me, uh, at new uh, and different ways to try to create and build trust um, because we don't think we're not even close. If, if you, if we're trustworthy in your eyes, great. Um, but I think we have a lot more work to do. Um, so coming back to you, Sally, I'm interested in hearing, and I, I know you referenced it earlier, but about, you know, the sort of the, the work that you're doing with newsrooms specifically about this right now, when we're talking about solving some of the problems. Um, so what is it that you guys are doing, especially with those, uh, those metrics applied there? Okay, great. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. telling about the trust project. So what, uh, one of the stories that I think really helps see why what we're doing makes sense is that when I travel a lot, I was um, one trip going back and forth to SFO, talk, I talked to the cab driver both ways. And on the way, I thought I had a pretty um, liberal cab driver. And I, we got to talking about what I'm doing. And, and he says, you just can't trust the news. And I said, well, why? He said, because it's, completely controlled by big business and government. And then on the way back, I got a driver who I think was pretty conservative and again, got to talking about what I do and he says, you can't trust the news. I'm like, well, why? Well, because it's completely controlled by big business and government. So t what the Trust Project is doing is working with newsrooms around the world to help give the people the information they need in order to understand um, how journalism is distinct from all other kinds of information that really are controlled by business or government. That this is the only kind of information that is truly designed to serve the public interest. So what we do, we have, um, right now we have 120 news sites showing these things called the trust indicators. And they are uh, transparency factors that provide information to you uh, built from the user research we did and from work done by senior executives from 80 different news organizations who came together to marry what users said would help them understand whether or not to trust a site, um, married that with journalistic values. And so we have eight trust indicators and what they show to the public is um, information about who and what is behind the news. So what are the, the principles and policies that um, that this organization stands by. So what is their ethics commitment? Do the, what is conflict of interest? Um, that, how do they deal with that? What do, do they have a commitment to bringing in diverse voices? What do they do when they make a mistake? How do they make their corrections? Where and when do, do, do they place them? Uh, information about the author. So who is this person that's producing the news? What's their expertise? Um, 
labels? Is it news? Is it analysis? Is it opinion? Is it some sort of content that has been paid for by the advertiser? Because we heard a lot from users that it felt like journalism was sort of merging those things and people were unhappy about that. Also, um, getting to what we heard a minute ago, how do you know what you know, journalists? So in some, for some stories, information about the actual sources that were um, more information about the sources that went into that story, just like PolitiFact is doing. And um, finally, information about is, this, is there local expertise built into this story? And in a way, is it locally sourced? Uh, do they know about my, demo, my demographic group? Do they know about uh, my region? Do they, were they actually there? And how much public engagement do, does this news organization really engage in? So these are all shown to the public. And then there's also signals that are provided to the news distribution platforms connected to those things that you see. And uh, the idea there is because so much is seen through these social media platforms and search, that can we help them do a better job of surfacing and lifting up trustworthy sources? And as, as you'll see, the idea here is to provide information to the public so that you can make inform decisions about what you want to trust and what you want to share, as opposed to just sort of handing you this evaluation based on a black box of uh, yes, this is good or no, this is bad. And as a result, I hope we can really shift the equation so that the, the public can in fact own these trust indicators and start having a stronger say in holding news organizations ac accountable and news organizations will hold themselves more accountable too. Thanks. You know, kind of taking off on that theme of, of the media literacy and transparency, and I know that that's something that both, you know, Sally, Lynn, um, I'm curious to know, you know, how, why is it that we are very much invested in the idea that, that media literacy and transparency is going to win back trust? So I think it comes back to what I mentioned earlier in that, in the fact that the public doesn't understand how journalism works and doesn't know how a journalist does their job. And why would they? We have never told them. It's just like, I've never run a kitchen at a restaurant, so how would I know how to do that, right? We haven't kind of torn back the pieces to show them. So the idea is that if we can explain and if we can tell them how we do our jobs, then instead of them having to make assumptions about how we do it, which normally turn out to be negative, we can meet at a place of mutual understanding to then discuss maybe how the journalism could be better, um, things we maybe could have done differently, instead of this negative assumption that comes to place that, um, I'll just I'll give an example, um, one that's very common, the use of an anonymous source. I know anytime I ask a member of the public that's a non-journalist um, what it means when someone has used an anonymous source, I get varied answers. Um, a lot of times people assume that we've never even met the person and or know exactly who that person is. Well, it's actually the complete opposite. If I'm an editor and my reporter wants to use an anonymous source, I probably know the name of who that person is. The reporter definitely knows the name of who that is in most cases, um, but we're concealing their identity for a certain reason. So it's not that we're just you know picking someone up off of Twitter and just using the information that they give us. So if we can kind of meet at a point where these assumptions don't need to be made because we are informing the public of how we did the job, then hopefully we can kind of have this mutual understanding um, to build off of. Um, the other goal that we really want to do too is to have news organizations increase their engagement with their audience. So this has been mentioned, this was mentioned earlier on the, uh, the panel before, um, you know, it used to just be a bunch of old white guys that were making decisions about what content was given and they were making those decisions. Well, in some cases that still is true um, and we need to be better, but can we then as journalists ask for, ask our communities, what were we missing? Did we miss a certain element of the story? Is there a community that we left out of the conversation? And when we ask that and we get that feedback, we can then decide to act on it and hopefully make the coverage better. Maybe go out and do an additional story involving that community on that same subject and linking it all together. So it's also this engagement component as well. Yeah, and um, you know, I know in the study that you did, Dr. Clark, there was there was mention of this as well that of really understanding how the gears are working behind the scenes, very much affecting the like sort of the minority communities' different responses to the the media. Can you kind of 
lighten me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned not just taking a source from Twitter and kind of plopping it into a story because that was one of the problems that the individuals that we talked to for our specific report on Twitter subcultures, uh, black Twitter, feminist Twitter, Asian American Twitter, mentioned when they talked about the process of making the news. That instead of source development being something they saw with their communities and the potential for engagement on these social media platforms, what they saw was journalists swooping in, taking the conversations that they were having and using them without proper context. And so one of the problems that they talked about uh, was a lack of engagement that goes beyond what we know as the traditional shoe leather reporting where you got out, you met people in the community, you spent time in the coffee shops and you went to the different uh, houses of worship to meet people when you can see them all online or at least the ones who use those social media platforms. So they were looking for more ways to engage with people to get them to actually um, not just take from those communities, but actually engage in equitable relationships with those communities, give and take, being able to exchange information and thus inform coverage that way. Now this one, I'm kind of interested in getting a quick take from all of you on this one, so it's, a, it's intriguing to me. And just last week, uh, Pew came out with a study that uh, said that research is now suggesting that younger people are better at discerning opinion from, from older audiences. And I'm wondering if this gives you guys some hope that you know, some of this idea of kind of the trust factor and the transparency, media literacy, that it's working, and if there's hope for the future based on this. Who wants to take it first? I'll go first. No. Uh, no. Uh, I, I actually think, I still think we have a, a, a big issue, uh, and younger people uh, have huge issues. Um, younger people, so y'all know what the New York Times is. It means something to you. Um, uh, young people, it, it doesn't have the same cachet. It doesn't mean as much. And when you consume your news on a platform, like Facebook, now they don't do it on Facebook, but Instagram or whatever, Every, all the content looks identical. That's what Facebook's really good at uh, in platforms. They make the content look exactly the same. If you search on Google, the result for junknews.com versus highly trusted, reputable source look identical to you. And in fact, the bad guys are getting really good at mimicking what the good guys try to do. Um, and I, so I, I think we've really uh, done a poor job educating uh, the uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers how to how to be better at discerning real from fake. Um, the Stanford in History Education Group here has done amazing research developing a curriculum, um, but I think they show that the, this is a problem. And so I guess what I would say is I trust Pew. I think they're reputable. But if they say younger audiences are better than older audiences, I would say they're both really bad. How about that? So <laughs> everybody's <Sorry>. bad. <laughs> so I. I actually disagree a little bit with that. I, I'm a millennial, and I very much own that. Um, and I think that the younger audiences are better than the older on audiences because they know social, they know digital, they know how to fact check, they are used to fact checking, they're used to seeing one article and then looking to see where else it goes. That's how they are consuming information. Um, so to me, when I saw that study, I wasn't surprised. Um, I do think it gives me some hope but it actually really, really worries me for the immediate future because I was doing some research about what media literacy programs are out there for a story that I'm writing, and a lot of the projects are based on K through 12, which is great. It's good that it's there, but there isn't a lot that's focused on once people are college age, people my parents' age, and my mother doesn't know how to use Facebook. I love her dearly, but she doesn't know how to. So there is this audience that I think does need this education because it's not something that they know how to use as well. And so can we reach them? And as far as what I was seeing with just the groups that are working in this space, most are working with K through 12. A good thing, but we need more to work with people that are not necessarily in school aged. Well, I would just say, I, one, I, I resist any kind of general characterizations by age group or any other group. Um, the study itself, I think, really ended up evaluating more how attached are you to your perspective as opposed to how well do you discern news from opinion because it had to do with uh, people assessing sp specific statements and is this fact or is this opinion. 
What we found in our user research, and I said we went across race, class, gender, generation, geography, we found these kinds of problems at every level, and we also found these avid news users in younger people, in older people. Sometimes we were really surprised at how amazing, I mean, unfairly surprised about how amazingly adept older people were at figuring out what they were looking at online and using the social networks and to, in order to um, gather information from a lot of different places, check, cross-check it, and push it out there. Millennials were the same way, I mean, some, the one, some of the ones that we talked with, and really felt in a way that it was their duty to get out there and correct the record. So I have, I feel, I'm just naturally optimistic anyway, but I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic across generation. I'm always naturally um, cautious, and that caution comes from working with young people at the collegiate level and then also coming out of newsrooms and always being wondering, um, always wondering what is coming next. And so on one end, I'm very encouraged that young people can pick out statements and separate fact from fiction, but I'm concerned about technologies that may disrupt their ability to do so. And what I'm thinking about is heavy engagement with visually based technologies, specifically with social media, Instagram being one of um, the most highly adopted platforms among younger people, and technologies that are being developed now that can change everything from the appearance of a person to the way that their voice sounds. Uh, how do we train young people to be able to detect what looks real to them? And so that's one of my primary concerns. I would add that there is a study that was released very recently, I believe on October 12th, by Project Information Literacy. It was headed by uh, Dr. Allison Head, and it looks at the way young people in college and high school in specific um, challenge the news, how they process the news, how they share the news. So there's a little more work that's being done, it's breaking news, I guess, <laughs> um, about information literacy among older populations, older in college, but there are a few things that are still out there where people are working with the uh, Gen Z, I believe, after the millennials. So, it's a mixed bag, we'll, we'll, we'll take that, we'll take that. Half true. Yeah, it's half true, yes, exactly. <laughs> well, knowing this crowd, having sat in this, this class over the last few weeks, I know everybody wants to talk about politics. I know that the questions come up all the time. Um, so Aaron, like, you know, looking at the coverage of, of US politics, and especially when we're talking about the midterms, you know, has fact checking helped in terms of you know, all of these issues, in terms of media literacy, misinformation, trust, uh, since it's been around, you know, yeah. for a while now, you've had you guys have seen seen it all in a way. Well, yeah. how I, much has it changed now? So I guess my first answer is I hope so. So I'm optimistic <laughs> about fact checking. Um, uh, no, I, I I think that the you know after the 2016 election, everyone kind of looked at fact checkers and said, Trump lied way more than Clinton, but Trump was elected. You guys failed at your job, right? Um, and uh, we never saw that as our job. Um, you know, I think we can go into the specifics of the election, but I'll set that aside. Uh, our job as a fact checker is not to tell you who to vote for. Um, I don't want you voting for the most honest candidate. I don't think that's necessarily the best measure. Uh, it's a measure, but it doesn't have to be the only one. Um, you know, I think we have been effective um, over, we started in 2007, so our first election was 2008, so that was our third presidential election. Um, I think we have kind of really broken through um, uh, as a type of journalism uh, so that newsrooms across the country now are having a conversation about when they tell a story, are they going to do it through a Q&A or a narrative or a video or a photo? I think now telling a story as a fact check is, um, is something that a lot of newsrooms are thinking about, which I think is really good. Um, the research on fact checking is amazing in that, uh, it, you know, it doesn't change how you vote necessarily, but you, you as a reader, when you read a fact check, you retain the information uh, better and longer than if you read a straight news story. Um, and the second thing, which is the president aside, the threat of being fact checked oftentimes makes politicians more cautious and careful about what they say, which is a good thing. I can't measure it, um, but there is research that we did in some of the states where we have 
um, relationships where we sent lawmakers three, there are three, law, lawmakers were sent into three groups. Group one was the control group, nothing happened to them. Group two got a letter that was kind of like League of Women voter style and was like, hey, you know, it'd be really good if you told the truth because it's good for democracy to tell the truth. Please tell the truth. Um, the third group got a letter that said, PolitiFact is in your neighborhood. They are gonna be watching the things you say. And if you say something wrong, they will set your pants on fire. Don't, don't lie. Um, they, they tracked fact checks for a year. The group that was least likely to tell the falsehood was the one who got the threat. And um, so I think there's, there's, there's effect we're having. Um, it's not nearly enough. We are, uh, uh, Michael said, we're the largest fact-checking organization in the United States. We are 12 people, okay? So, um, and I'm here with you, and the president's probably somewhere talking. Um, so we can't do everything. So the other thing we have to do is tr train you uh, and everyone to be their own fact-checker. And so, like Sally's trust indicators, one of the cool things that they also do is they kind of work in reverse. So if you look at her indicators and say, what websites don't have that stuff? that could make you say, I should be a little skeptical of that. We need to be teaching you uh, how to do reverse Google image searches, how to do lateral le reading, which is to kind of move from website to website, um, how to look for proper sourcing, how to see if you, you can see on a website, oh, I can contact the author. That looks like a real person. That's a good sign, you know? Uh, so I think we have a lot more to do in that, in, in that regard, but I think we've made progress over the 11 years that we've been doing it and happy. I have uh, one last one I'd like to hear your guys' take on before we open it up to some of the questions from the audience here. And you know, we have a study that came out a few weeks ago about the spread of news deserts, which we talked a little bit about here last week too. The, the loss of local news, places where there's not necessarily a local newspaper, a local TV station, or local media anymore. And I'm curious to hear, especially you know, because you're coming from some different backgrounds and have talked to a lot of people in the field, you know, how much is that affecting trust and affecting the work that you're doing to whoever wants to go first? One, one of the biggest complaints that, that we hear, that our partners have heard, is that um, people don't understand if they're reading their local newspaper why something comes across and it says Associated Press. And that makes them either very angry or they don't understand you know, how that content got in there and how the local journalist, were they involved in the process? Did they have anything to do with it, any of that? So that type of, so the news desert, right? If there is this news desert, if there are less journalists, you're gonna be using more content that is coming from the Associated Press, that's coming from maybe your corporate reporter that's in DC, any of that. Um, and what we found is that audiences generally, that does make them sort of question or maybe distrust that information that's coming because it's not coming directly from their local news organization or that local reporter and they wonder why didn't you send someone to DC and so as so what we are seeing is that is a, that's a complaint and kind of a cause of distrust when they aren't seeing their own local reporters reporting the content yeah and I, I would I just feel what's happening to local news is devastating to not only the information system you know the new the quality news we need to be getting from every level, but also to trust overall. Because one of the things, when I told you that people are interested, they, like they want to know, does this journalist understand my community? Does this journalist understand me? And as Lynn can tell you, there's strong trust in the local news organization. So if you're just getting news from a national site only, and you, you don't see your own community, your own selves in the news, then you're much less likely to trust it. And that's something we heard across the board too. We heard from people saying, we want to hear from people like ourselves in the, in the news, we want to hear uh, from people unlike ourselves in the news, not just at high levels of business and government. So when you think about that's what national news does best and international news does best, is bring you to the voices of people at high levels of business and government but not the local news. And local national news tends to pull from local news. So it really does undermine the quality overall of what we're getting. I would want to complicate um, our definition of local news and what we're thinking about when we talk about local news. If it's the papers that were run by major corporations that used to be in our towns that have uh, shrunk in size, that are no longer there, they've left and it's not so much a news desert as it is a news ghost town. That there were people that there were there. This isn't a naturally occurring phenomenon. 
I'm curious about whether we're including the perspective of ethnic newspapers, of uh, specific language-based newspapers, um, and organizations that have been there, that have been reporting on the communities, but are overlooked because they are not what we continue to think about as local news. So I'd start by complicating the question. And then I, I am not as, I would say, concern from the perspective that um, I think this is something, it's a, it's a single solution that we need to address. I think it has great historical implications in that if communities, if news organizations had established stronger ties with the communities they, they served and all of those communities that they serve, I ask the question whether they would have more buy-in from people who could potentially subscribe to the paper, who could support the advertising revenues and, and patronize the advertisers that are trying to cater to a number of diverse audiences. And I think about that in terms of my own um, hometown's newspaper, the story that gets me, is that in 2004, I was 24 years old, and the paper ran a correction on the front page it was about 22 words. It said the Lexington, Kentucky, Lexington Herald leader has, uh, it's come to our attention that the Lexington Herald leader has failed to cover the civil rights movement. <laughs> the editor regrets the error. <laughs> wow. So some 50 years later, admitting that there is a whole segment of history that as Alex mentioned earlier, a few white guys in a room decided was not important enough to cover. That alienates an entire generation of people. Those people are potential subscribers, they're potential contributors. And having made those choices then, we're seeing the effects of them play out now in local news. Ooh, we just gotta, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll simply say, I'll just, I always gotta talk. Um, um, for in the fact checking world, local fact checks are way more tangible, and so they they do build trust. And so uh, we've seen this play out in the work we do. If I told you uh, the traffic in Palo Alto is just excellent and always <laughs> the the roads are always free and clear, you would throw tomatoes at my face because you know that's not true. If I told you that there was a caravan of uh, you know, angry migrants coming to, to knock down the border, you can't see that with your own eyes. So then you have to come to your political beliefs to say whether or not you think that's true. So I think the more we can do at the local level, of course you can build trust because you can participate in the stories in a way you can't as we, uh, when we don't cover local communities and issues. All right, we're gonna go to some audience questions here. Uh, this is a great one for us to start with. So, would you all address the case of two sides? You know, the binary, you know, he said, she said, this person said this, this person said that, approach to news, where it involves, um, you know, discriminating, exclusionary, racist issues especially. You know, how, how that's affecting our news, but also if there's, you know, what the danger is for all of us when we're focusing on this he said, she said situation. And this is to all of you. So whoever would like to take that one. <laughs> well, I can certainly speak yeah. about concerns <laughs> about uh, this dichotomous approach to journalism that insists that there are two sides to every story. I have taught my students for years now that there are many sides to every story. Herbert Gans, when he did his seminal study on American newsrooms, uh, came out with recommendations that talked about multi-perspectival journalism. So providing multiple perspectives to the news stories that we see so that people can use the information that we are producing to make decisions in their everyday lives. In order to make really informed decisions, you need to have a multiplicity of voices involved in those stories. When you boil things down for the sake of reporting on deadline, reporting to a particular space, uh, and reporting for a very narrow audience, you miss so many parts of the story. And what you can wind up doing, and what I think we're seeing now, is normalizing voices that do not belong in mainstream media. Normalizing positions that are harmful, that uh, use infl inflammatory rhetoric to espouse their points. 
um, that just do not belong. They are not legitimate. They can be quite dangerous. But if we rely on this old trope that there are two sides to every story, then there's no contesting that because I got this one person who said something that was totally radical, I now have to get someone else who's totally radical and I don't get to work in the middle at all. <laughs> Anyone else want to add to that one? I'll, I'll simply say that, sorry, I'm going to do it again. PolitiFact was founded really to combat this idea of he said, she said reporting. Um, the, the, the origin story of PolitiFact is 2004 uh, Republican National Convention. Zell Miller, a Democrat, is giving uh, a speech in support of George W. Bush, lays into John Kerry over defense spending. Um, our founder read the stories the next day. It was Zell Miller said, John Kerry's terrible on defense spending, quote, quote, quote. Uh, John Kerry uh, pushed back saying this was all untrue, quote, quote, quote. Zell Miller defended his, what he said, saying, quote, quote, quote. End of story. If you read it, you had no idea who was right. And as a journalist, I think it's, it's incumbent on us when we can take the time to say who's right and who's wrong. And we don't have to give equal weight to the wrong side, right, uh, on matters of fact. And so that's the story of political. Well, we're going to keep you on deck here, so okay. get your water in fast. <laughs> um, uh, the audience would like to know who decides what PolitiFact decides to fact check uh -huh. and how, and, and who checks the fact checkers. <laughs> who check? you, the, the second part the is easy. You. You all check the fact checkers. Trust me. Uh, if we get something wrong, people will find out, uh, will quickly alert us, and we will issue a correction. In fact, if you really want to see all our errors, you can go to politifact.com and look at our subject tags. We list every correction we've ever issued. Um, and so uh, when we make a mistake, it's often because we didn't have information. It's usually not because we were wrong. Um, it's be a lot of times politicians will play games with us. They won't participate. Uh, we'll issue a verdict and I'll say, I can't believe you missed this. Well, it's usually because we didn't know it existed. Um, how do we pick what we check in the process real, real briefly? Um, we, we choose what we check using news judgment. So our reporters every day look at the top of the television news, the front page of the newspaper, what are the big stories people are talking about, and then we go in search of things to fact check about them. We do not keep a tally where it's like a Republican today, a Democrat tomorrow. We do not keep a tally if it's like a true today, it has to be a false tomorrow. Um, we make news judgments about what we want to fact check. However, I will say, we, we do make sure we fact check everyone. No, no one is off limits from the truth meter and we make that really clear. Um, from there, the one thing I want to highlight about our process is a reporter goes through the process and does our fact checks. The reporter uh, recommends a verdict, a rating, but the reporter actually doesn't decide. We have three editors who sit as a jury. Um, they read every fact check I'm on. Uh, I've been on most of the 16,000 that we've published over 11 years. Uh, we read, sit, we have jury instructions, like four questions we ask ourselves. Uh, we go through that process and we issue that verdict. 75% um, of the time we're in unanimous agreement. Uh, if it's a 2-1 vote, so to speak, um, we'll use your, maybe it's a case to do more reporting or ask questions, where are the holes? Um, sometimes we just kind of agree to disagree and we move on. Um, but every process is pretty thorough. It takes at least a day usually to do a fact check. Uh, sometimes it could take a week or 10 days. Uh, and sometimes that conversation, that jury conversation, can be 30 seconds. Some days it can literally go over a day because we're kind of hanging up the phone at each other arguing about what we think it should be. So. Okay. Well, knowing that we only have five minutes left, I feel like this is a, a good one that we can each give one example of. Um, so, you know, we've talked a lot about what we do, what we in media are trying to do to solve these problems, but uh, we'd like to know what, what can the consumers of news do to, to solve, solve this problem, to do their own fact checking, to fight disinformation, all of the above. I know there's a lot, so I'm gonna say one from each person. And Lynn, I'm gonna start with you. So kind of building off um, what, what you were just talking about, something that we encourage and try to get our news organizations to do is, if you are in the public and if you see something that's incorrect, like please let that news organization know. Um, the thing about journalism is, yes, we are reporting on the facts, but we're reporting on the facts from the time that we are writing the story right in that moment, right? Things change, there might be something that happened right after deadline was pushed, and yes, we should do an update and there needs to be an update, but 
the thing you were reading is like in a slice of time with what was known at that moment. And a lot of times we may not get information. Talk about politicians and the government. They are like so hard to get information from nowadays. It's become really, really difficult. So if you ever see something that you think is incorrect, please contact that news organization. Let them know if you have um, a document or just any kind of information who they could talk to so they can correct it. Like, please let them know. That's going to go a long way. I'll go next. Um, thanks again for having me. Um, I would say, how many people know someone on social media who shares what you would consider fake news? Interact with these people, okay? <laughs> uh, trust me, I don't, I don't want to do it either. However, uh, everyone has the crazy Uncle Joe, right, who sh shares the, the kooky stories. Typically, we just avoid the conversation because like, oh, that's crazy Uncle Joe, you know, like just being crazy. Um, what I really w should suggest is this is a public health crisis of, of uh, and so we will do better the more we are all engaged and so as difficult as it may seem and as much as you might not want to it might be helpful to say hey Uncle Joe where'd you get that information from and then can I show you a couple of other stories that might help you understand you don't have to do it in a mean way you don't have to say you're fired you're a liar or whatever um, you know have a nice conversation because I think uh, what we definitely know is the best way, so I can't change you how you vote, and I'm not trying, but uh, the best way people can change how other people think are by based on people they know, right? So people who know each other having a conversation about issues and facts um, can have a much better resolution uh, than if I was trying to come in or if Facebook was trying to come in, Lord help us, and say, this is wrong. So engage, talk. Tell jo crazy Uncle Joe I said hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, well, and I want to echo the thank you. It's a great question. It's great moderation. Great opportunity. Um, I would ask you to really own the trust indicators, so you can find these transparency factors on um, locally on the San Jose Mercury News. You can find them on the Washington Post. You can find them on. Tegna television stations around the country. You can find them on BBC. And look at our website, it's thetrustproject.org. And if you go to the list that of the FAQ, you can see what the trust indicators are and start looking for them. And, and if you don't see them, then there's a reason for questions. If you see them, then think about, well, how do these um, make sense to me? How can I spread these? Um, spread use of these. So can you talk to your friends about them? Can you talk to your local librarian and get the library to use them in the various ways that librarians start to build um, media literacy? Are there teachers you can talk with? Are there groups that you might want to meet with uh, to talk over the news and use these trust indicators as a way to engage folks? So again, the idea here is to really take ownership and be involved in making informed decisions about the news and helping one another. And those ideas came from a group very much like yours. So I think there's plenty of opportunity and I, and I hope you take it. Uh, one thing about engaging with that crazy news, engage offline because depending on the platform that you're using, engaging online may actually incentivize the posting. So one thing to consider. But I like to think about strategies and approaches more than solutions. I think of solutions being very fixed. And when we're talking about media, technology, and social norms, and how these things are always shifting, uh, you want to think about the way that we can be responsive to the struggle of the moment. The challenges that we have right now are very different than the ones that we experienced last year or 10 years before. I would go back to the, uh, the appeal that Lynn made about being involved and think of yourself as a source. Looking around at the coverage that you get, see who's missing, whose voices are missing for the from the coverage, contact news outlets to let them know who's missing from the content. And if you know someone who could be an expert or who has a context, context or perspective that is necessary for those stories, put folks in touch. Media is yours. You are a part of this whole system. It does not work without your input. So be a source. And I'm going to add in, as a moderator privilege, one more for you guys. Um, I've, I've studied disinformation and misinformation for years. And you, know, uh, you, know, you mentioned earlier about 
the bad guys who are really good at looking like the good guys. So the fake news sites, the sites that are popped up out of nowhere, sometimes they're made by Russia, sometimes they're not, that are made to look like real news. And one of the things they don't do very well is sourcing. So if you're seeing a story and the facts are according to who, like you need to ask that question all the time when you're reading it. Who is this supposedly coming from? Because often they don't even say, or it's, this, it's not even citing an anonymous source, it's citing a nobody source. It's just saying it like it's a fact. And if there isn't a source, if there isn't a quote, if there isn't a link, and if there is a link, it might be a link to another site that's just like that one. If you're seeing yourself going down a link rabbit hole where there's still nobody who is actually owning that information, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that that is a fake story and a fake website and a fake reporter, and you should never go to that website again. And you should tell your friends that too. Yeah. So that concludes tonight. I'd like to thank our panel. Yeah. And also, uh, big thanks to, to Don and to Michael, too, for bringing this all together and bringing you all here. Yeah. Well, five weeks certainly went fast, didn't it? I was thinking about the Carol Burnett song. It's so, I'm so glad we had this time together. <laughs> uh, just want to say a couple of things. Over these five weeks, we've covered a lot of territory. Um, we had about 30 speakers, journalists, media analysts, media experts from around the country, from around the world, and around the block, and right here at Stanford uh, and in Silicon Valley. So we've talked about how independent, uh, independent press protects press freedom, how one of the most important functions of a free press is to help hold the powerful accountable to the people, whether that's government, corporations, or maybe Facebook. You've heard uh, journalists themselves talk about how to cover and how they're covering and navigating issues of personal identity while trying to inform the public on issues of bias, intolerance, and injustice. We had some local people talking about how failing business models and changing reader habits have really decimated the local news organizations in communities here in Silicon Valley and really all around the country, and how news startups are trying and emerging to fill those gaps. Tonight, we talked about the flood of misinformation online and how it's tainting the quality of information that we need to make good decisions. You also got over your initial shyness about asking questions. <laughs> you had some great questions over these five weeks. So Michael Bolden and I have really enjoyed building this class and uh, coming up with uh, this journalism uh, sessions for you. We greatly appreciate your interest in learning about journalism and about its role in democracy. I want to thank everybody who made this class possible, my co-host, Michael Bolden. Yay. <laughs> Uh, all the talented people at Continuing Studies, uh, there are many, I'll just name a few, Charlie Junkerman, Alexandra Agropopoulos, Jack Kirkner, and Al, uh, Amy Tofield. Thanks to the JSK staff, especially Enrico Benjamin, who's been up front here, who, doing our live streaming and uh, social media, Erica Bartholomew, who's been the question, question whisperer. <laughs> Uh, and in the back, John and Mike are the Stanford video uh, and audio staff who uh, were with us each and every night to keep us sounding good and looking good. So finally, I just want to end with, uh, to echo the, the last panel and their conversation about how media does not really exist or survive and well without you. So I want to call to action to ask for all of your help. So we live in tumultuous times. For our, for our journalism, for our democracy, and really around the world. So access to relevant, truthful information is really key to what we need to sustain our communities, wherever they are. Quality information is crucial to supporting democracy. And we all know for certain there are such things as facts and the truth. They do exist. So here's what I'm going to ask of you. Support your local newspaper and news organization, your local radio station. Yes, read the New York Times. But more important, your local media needs you more than ever. How are you going to know what's going on if they just disappear? There's a quote I read recently that is a little dark, but I thought quite telling, which it said, first they came for the journalists, and I did not speak up because I was not a journalist. 
We have no idea what happened after that. <laughs> so live your ideals. Seek out ways to help journalism. All of you are here because you're interested in journalism and democracy. Stay informed so you can fully participate in your community, in the life of your community. Keep your eye out for other events like this. There will be others, um, not necessarily from us this next quarter, but the Continuing Studies program has sessions. The JSK Fellowships may have some sessions in the future. And partners that we have who are actually in the audience tonight, the Stanford Journalism and Democracy Initiative, the JDI, which is the Brown Institute for Media Studies and the Stanford Journalism Program and JSK will have occasional events. Uh, and then adopt a journalist. <laughs> Find journalists, you, they, we obviously we're people that you can talk to, you can reach out to them whether you have a question, whether you have a correction, whether you have information about something they should know about. And get to know them. Help us help journalism thrive because our world depends on it. Thank you and good night and good luck. <laughs>